your chancellor's wedding yesterday. We had a wonderful day, it was absolutely brilliant, and uh, we're going to pray for them in just a minute. But what I found really amusing this morning was, was I've seen at least uh, three or four people come in and go, <laughs> because they didn't know where to sit, and it was brilliant. So it's great. I think what I might do is start handing out chairs on the door as people come in. <laughs> And then there's, there's no prescribed seating area for anybody, is there? You just sit where you want, or, or not. Maybe we get some bunks or something on the wall, something, wouldn't it? Especially for certain time when it's been preaching. But um, anyway, let's pray for this time in Chelsea before we go on with our service this morning. I don't know why they're not here this morning. Um, I can guess they're probably enjoying their first day of marriage. But uh, Lord, today, we thank you for Simon and Chelsea, Mr. and Mrs. Roberts, Lord. We pray for them, we lift them up, and their whole family, uh, especially uh, for Caroline and Hannah, who are here with us, uh, working with our children, our young people. Lord, we bring them into your presence and ask God that you will, Lord, you will just go with them today and throughout their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just want to share a few verses with you. Very, very well known verses. This musician starts playing as we come to a place of worship today. Would you just, would you do me a favor? Would you, would you just close your eyes for a moment? And just know that today we are here not to satisfy ourselves, but to worship the living God. And would you just say in your heart right now, Lord, I worship you. Lord, I lift up your name. Lord, would you do your work in my life and in my heart today? As I praise you, as I worship you, would you have your way in my life? Just listen to these words of scripture written so many thousands of years ago, but so relevant today. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Who would do with some still waters in their life today? He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your God and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Sure, your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, today, let us worship you. Let us praise you with open hearts, knowing that you are the sustainer and provider of all things in Jesus' name. Amen.
as I often say, testimony is not just your history, it's your current reality, it's what God is doing in your life right now. Takes these, also, also takes out another one, it's uh, I did pray a couple of weeks ago that I was going to get one of those clippers that they have in a Catholic church, but they're probably standing still at the right time, but I'm not sure when I'm going to stand and sit myself, so it's, it's okay. We're pretty much about as non conformist as you can get, which is alright by me, because I think Jesus was a bit of a non conformer. Would anyone like to come share something this week? No, I won't labor this. I will just say this I want to share that um, obviously, yesterday we celebrated the wedding of Simon and Chelsea, and it's fantastic to celebrate love, and they, they stood. We had that arch there that Simon had made, and it was at the front here with a, a long white carpet scattered the rose petals in the middle. And this week there's something else that I love. Well, today there's something else that I love right here at the arch. And this is quite good. This will all become apparent a little bit later. But it's quite possibly the most elaborate sermon illustration I've ever brought. But um, but what was great was seeing Simon and Chelsea standing here and declaring their love for each other before God. And I just want to say that that really, really blessed me to see this young couple. Because let's face it, marriage is not overly popular these days, is it, for many people. But to see them there,
together. But the uh, kids are going to be going out very shortly to uh, super, I think the superheroes. That was not church. <laughs> How long ago was that? I've been here four years. <laughs> the kids are going, to, are going to be going out very shortly to urban states. And uh, thank you for those leaders who have taken them out. Uh, that's for ages 4 to 11 if you have younger children. We have put some things out there and there's a speaker on out there if you want to take them out. It's totally up to you. And uh, let's just watch it.
bike and I sat on the bike and I rode the bike around the car park and I just thought, what a fantastic piece of kit. Now I'm aware that this is going out on the radio next week and so uh, they probably won't be able to see it, but I'm sitting on a motorbike, for the benefit of those listening on home I'm sitting on a motorbike uh, looking at the congregation who mostly have slightly used looks on their faces. So, Anyway, this is Jeremy's bike, and it is very, very nice. I'm not going to drop it when I get off. I don't think I've ever dismounted a motorbike while I've been holding a microphone before. It's a very, very nice bike. It is far better than my old 2004 motorcycle. Maybe one day I'll be able to buy one of those for myself. But when I saw Jeremy coming in there and I really liked it, I thought to myself, oh, I wonder. But I immediately put that thought out of my mind because I know that I can't. But the thought went through my mind, I wonder. I wonder if I could. And then I thought of my wife and I thought, no, I can't. <laughs> because I know that I can't. And, um, do you know, I, was, I said yesterday, Simon and Chelsea's wedding, that uh, most brides come into the church thinking, I'll alter him. You know, that's the process for the wedding ceremony. So I think about it. I'll alter him. Anyway, there we go. And I thought to myself, maybe one day I'll be able to find one of these for myself. Somebody's just got it out there. Tumbleweed. And I thought to myself, maybe one day I'll be able to get one of those, but I've got other priorities in my life right now. But I'm pleased for my friend Jeremy that he's got a great bike. Yes, I would like it. I would even go so far as to say as I admire this bike. And I would like one, but I'm not in the slightest bit jealous of Jeremy. I don't lie awake at night scheming over, to, over how to make what is his mine. And I don't spend time thinking about how to procure a bike like this so that I can be like Jeremy. I bear him no ill will in the fact that he has one and I don't. And I don't spend time fixating on the fact that he has one of these bikes and I don't. I'm just happy for him that he has one. I'm happy that he is able to enjoy it. I'm happy that he goes out there with the wind in his face <laughs> and is able to enjoy this machine. He's got more hair than me, to be fair. Let's look for a moment at Jesus' words in Luke 12, 15. Jesus said, uh, then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist of an abundance of of possessions. Amen. They were the words of Jesus. Life does not consist of an abundance of possessions. You can have everything that the world would throw at you. You can have houses, you can have cars, you can have motorbikes, you can have a beautiful wife, you can have a devastatingly handsome husband. You can have everything that you want. You can fill your life with stuff. At the moment, we, we've just bought a house and now we're looking at everything that needs doing in there. And I go into other people's houses and I go, oh, nice bathroom tiles, or oh, nice kitchen countertop, I like the marble, and uh, nice tiles on the floor, nice carpet. And I look at other things and, and I think they're great, but I don't fixate myself on them. Because I know that even if I get those things, they will not make the slightest bit of difference to my life or to my happiness. But we do that, don't we? We, uh, we get into this mindset of thinking that possessions equal happiness, and that's where covetousness comes in. If I can just get this job like so-and-so, then my life will be fulfilled. If I can just get that same car as my boss that he owns, then I will be happy. Because look, he looks happy, so if I get the things that he has, then I must be happy. But rarely do we know actually what's going on inside of their lives. 
If I can just get these clothes by this celebrity on TV, then people will accept me and they will think that I am successful and happy. And we wear, don't we, our possessions like a badge of honor because deep down inside, often, we want to be coveted. It's been four weeks since I've preached, I'm getting out of practice. <laughs> deep down inside, we want to be coveted. We want other people to desire the things that we have in our lives and to desire our lifestyles. And what this, I believe, comes down to is identity. But what I have to realize is that nobody would think any different about me. No one would, no one would think any more of me if I had Jeremy's bike. I'm sure not one of you would think that I was a better pastor or church leader if I wrote that to church on a Sunday morning. As much as I would like it, it wouldn't actually make any difference to my life whatsoever. It wouldn't make my life any better because it wouldn't make my eternity any better. What I have to realize is that these that there are more important things in the world than what we have. In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves steal and break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there is your heart also. Incredible words from Jesus in the same chapter. A little bit later he goes on to say, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you will drink or about your body or what you will wear. It's not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not much more valuable? I'm sorry, are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your lives? No, we can't, can we? We look at it, we worry about trying to get hold of all of these things, but they won't add anything to our lives. Where is your treasure? Where is your heart? Is it in the craving of material things or in the things that other people have? Or is it in the desire to be like somebody else? Or is your heart resting in the treasures of heaven, in the knowledge that God is enough? He is all sufficient. 2 Peter 1 verses 2 to 3 says, Grace and peace be yours in abundance, abundance. Through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. When Jesus said, don't worry, he used the metaphor of the birds, don't worry about these things, look at the birds of the air. I don't think he was just saying, don't worry about where our next meal is coming from, although that's certainly part of it. Does Philippians not say he will supply all of our needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus? But he wasn't just saying that, he was also saying, don't fret about trying to keep up with your friends and neighbours. Don't fret about trying to keep up with people on social media. Don't fret about trying to keep up with people on the television. Don't fret about trying to be like them because your identity is in Jesus. And He knows who you actually need to be and who you are called to be. It's important to understand at this point, I think, that it's, there's nothing wrong with material possessions. Jeremy is not committing a sin by having this motorbike. More than pity, because then he'd have to repent of him to me. But <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing wrong, in all seriousness, there's nothing wrong with material possessions. Work hard, by all means, apply yourself to your job, to your study, buy the things that you like. If somebody is successful in business, 
Why shouldn't they enjoy a comfortable lifestyle? It is the identity and the value that we place in possessions that is the issue. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy 6 10, uh, often misquoted as saying money is the root of all evil, but it doesn't say that. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's where we place our, our where we put our value in those things. It is the jealousy that arises and eats us up when we desire the things that other people have. But that is different to admiration. It is different to celebration with our friends when they're successful and when they're blessed. In Mark chapter 10, a wealthy young man comes to Jesus and asks what he must do to gain eternal life. And Jesus knows the young man's heart and he's testing him. He says to him, keep the Ten Commandments. And he says, well, I've always done that and more. So Jesus says to him, okay, because Jesus is testing him, he knows that in his heart he hasn't kept this last commandment. So Jesus says to him, sell everything that you have and give the proceeds to the poor. And the young guy walks away crestfallen. Because he knows that Jesus knows that he places more value in earthly possessions than he does in his eternal security. Jesus wasn't saying that we have to sell everything and live like a hermit in order to get to heaven. He was saying that there are more important things in life than what we own, like where we're going. In his study on the Ten Commandments, the great theologian D.L. Moody says that covetousness is a form of greed. He says it's fixating on getting things that aren't ours, and we can trace that sin right back to the Garden of Eden with that original sin that plunged mankind into separation from God. What does it say? It says that Eve saw the fruit and it looked good. It looked pleasing to the eye. She desired it. She wanted something that she was told she cannot have. And so her husband was with her and they took it and they ate it. And covetousness and that value and identity that we place on possessions is still today the root of so much sin and corruption in the world. It's not about possessions, it's about what we do with those possessions. I remember once when I was at Bible college, there was a guy in my class, his name was Phil, and he was about the same size as me, and he came in one day with a new jacket on. And I said to him, Phil, I really like your jacket. That's a nice jacket. Can I try it on? And he said, yeah, sure. And he gave me the jacket. I tried it on. And I thought, oh, this fits. This is nice. This is good. And I took it off. And I said, where did you get it? And he told me. And I said, that's a nice jacket, mate. There you go. Take it back. Thank you. And he said, no, you keep it. And I said, no, no, Phil. Just, just take the jacket. And he said, no, no, you keep it. You like it. It's nice. You have it. And I said, no, Phil, Phil, I wasn't asking you to give me your jacket. I was trying it on because it was a nice jacket. And he said, no, you keep it. And he insisted that I keep his jacket. And I was, what, what do I do with this? I can't just keep the guy's jacket. But let me tell you, that is kingdom mentality. That is kingdom mentality. Just give it. And I've done those things in the past. I'm sure we all have. I'm not going to boast about that from the platform, but I know we've all done acts of generosity when God has moved in our hearts. But it's when we place the value of those things. Does the world not say, I want to live this way. I want to have the life that other people have. It doesn't matter what God wants or what God says in his word. I can reinterpret that. I can say that, that, that those scriptures are wrong because I want to live this way. I want to do things this way. I want to do what I want to do. And I believe this actually goes back before the Garden of Eden, before that sin of Adam and Eve. It's the original sin of Lucifer. For those who don't know, Lucifer was one of the chief angels in heaven before the fall, before he became Satan. 
before he committed that sin which caused him to be thrown out of heaven and to dwell on the earth. Another common misconception, Satan at this point in time is not in hell, he is in the earth going to and fro in it. But I believe he committed that sin, it's the sin that brought death into being. In, in Isaiah chapter 14, we read what's called the five I wills of Lucifer. It says this, how you have fallen from heaven, morning star, that's Lucifer, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned upon the mountain assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Saffron. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But it goes on, but you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Lucifer coveted God. He coveted his position. He coveted the worship that was due to God. He wanted to be like him. But now that he knows that he can't be like him, he wants to make us, mankind, who are made in God's image, he wants to make us like him. I believe that one of the greatest lies that is forced upon the world these days is be yourself. You be who you want to be. Don't you let anybody tell you that it is wrong. We are not called to be who we want to be. Because that is always a corrupted vision of ourselves. That we have that vision of ourselves that we have is always based upon coveting others and their lifestyles. The only lifestyle that we should desire is a godly lifestyle. Don't do it your way, do it God's way. Every time I conduct a funeral and they have that song at the end, I did it my way, I want to weep because there is nothing I would want said about me less after I've gone than he did it his own way. Our view of ourselves is always based upon corruptible flesh. But when we look to God, we have a lifestyle modeled on Him, not upon corruptible flesh. Let me give you three really quick scriptures. 1 John 2, 6 says, Whoever claims to live in Him must live as Jesus lived. Ephesians 5, 1 2, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us as a fragrant offering, and the sacrifice to God. And Ephesians 4, 22, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made to you in the attitude of your minds, and to put on your new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Be yourself. No. Strive to be like God. And to have His will done in your life. Yes, we are broken beings. We can never attain that. But Paul says we can strive towards it. We fell off back then. Let me ask you a couple of challenging questions today. What do you desire? What do you truly desire? In the depths of your heart, what do you want? You don't have to tell me out loud. God knows. And you can't lie to him. Jeremiah 17 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. What do you yearn after more than anything in the world? What is your number one priority in life? If our answer to any of those questions is anything other than God, then we need to do some soul searching and we need to do some repenting. But surely God can't be more important than my family. Surely God can't be more important than my job or my relationship. The fact is, when we desire God foremost in our lives, everything else falls into place. 
place. The absolute best thing in the world that I can do for my children is to put God first. That is how I love my children the best, is by putting God first. It's like by doing that, I'm placing them into God's hands in the knowledge that He will care for them, He will protect them, He will prosper them in all things far better than I can. Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and everything else will be added to you. Everything else, look towards God, that means look towards Him first, and everything else will happen. Don't worry about it, just let it happen. Look to God. Don't look to all these things. I'm purposely not looking at Jeremy's mind now. I'm looking at God. Where's the cross? <laughs> Do not covet. What I find really interesting is that all of the other commandments can be measured. It can be seen when we're putting other gods before God. It can be seen when we are making idols, when we're misusing God's name or not honouring God with our time, with our salary. It is obvious when we are not honouring our mother and father. There are laws even today against murdering, against stealing, against adultery, against lying. And all of these things can be seen and judged externally. But coveting is the one commandment that no one knows about. It's the easiest one to hide from people, but we can't hide it from God. It's absurd, isn't it, to think that uh, this could be placed on any human statue book. It would be impossible to enforce. Imagine the police coming around and saying, uh, we're going to arrest you because you want your neighbor's car, when you haven't actually done anything about it. That's why Jesus says, that if you harbour evil against someone in your heart, it's the same as murdering them. If you look lustfully at somebody with desire in your heart, it is the same as adultery. God doesn't look at how clean the outside of the cup is. He looks at the inside. In God's eyes, coveting something in your heart is the same as laying your hands upon it and stealing it. Coveting somebody's wife is the same as taking her to your bed. Coveting and stealing are two sides of the same coin. Coveting is theft inside the shell. Stealing is theft outside of the shell. And I want to ask you today, how clean is your cup on the inside? King David coveted, didn't he? He saw somebody else's wife and he desired, he lusted for her. That grew into adultery. And even into murder. David was the king. He was clean on the outside, but inside he needed some work. That's why when he was eventually confronted with his sin by the prophet Nathan, he cried out, Psalm 51, read it when you get home. He says these words, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. He goes on in verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant within me a willing spirit to sustain me. As we draw this amazing series to a close, we need to know this today. Just listen. We need to know, would you stand with me? We need to know whether it is coveting, whether it's stealing, whether it's murdering, whether it's keeping our time from God, whether it's putting other things before Him, whatever it is, when we come to Him, when we repent of our sin, when we choose to say sorry and turn away from those things. As Sam says, so often when we keep our side of the street clean, we can know that God is our Father in Heaven and He is always there, ready with open arms to in, that joy, that purity, that renewal is His true desire for every one of us. And He turns nobody away that comes to Him. He can clean your cup on the outside and the inside. One of my favorite verses in the Bible 
is in the story of the prodigal son. And uh, most of us know the story the guy goes to his dad and he asks for his inheritance and he goes out and he blows it all and he has great big parties and he lives it up in the city and gets into all sorts of things and then he, his money's gone and his friends who aren't great really friends at all, they leave and they go and he's left there feeding the pigs. Bear in mind this is a Jewish audience, how despicable that would have been, that, that would literally would have been like, um, do you know what, I, I'm not even going to use an illustration because it would have been the most horrendous thing that they could possibly imagine. Nothing else comes close to that. And he decides to go home, ask his dad if he can just work for him to be one of his servants. And he starts coming home, and this is the verse that I love, it says, whilst he was still far off, his father saw him. That to me means that God isn't sitting at home watching Netflix with his feet up. He's waiting and watching for you to come to him. He's constantly got his eyes open the stage. Let's pray. Father, today, we simply ask that these commandments will live in our hearts. Lord, help us keep our eyes open.
there is tea and coffee available, and I think there are some leftover brownies, rocky road, and biscuits from yesterday. Um, which, if they don't get eaten, I can 